Welcome everyone to the continuation of the series with Dr. Roger Strachan. Uh, we are now doing the Wilderness Part 3 and we recommend you go back and watch, if you haven't already, the rest of the series. We have the origins of the self soul spirit model as well as the first two parts of the Wilderness Encounter. As so, well as structural analysis. Yes. yeah, and there's Because that gives you the academic and the overall uh, actual sense of skeleton in which everything hangs. Yes. So it's good to have that. And I'll go over a little of that now because now as we move into the uh, third wilderness way, um, you'll begin to see how the use of the self-soul-spirit model when people have done their mandalas work directly within wilderness settings. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so that's, yeah. that's, that's the reason fantastic. for going back and making sure you understand it. Yep. And Someone asked about the mandala too. Yep. Yeah, and also in any case, we will have a link in the description where you can go back and watch previous podcasts that we've done so that you can get caught up. So, Very good. Yeah, here we yeah. are. Here what we do you are. got for us today? Where are we going? Okay, today um, I want to quickly uh, tie together the first two. and uh, <clears throat> First two wilderness? Yes, and then tie them back to self, soul, spirit. And then, uh, once again, go over the principles. Great. So to begin with, um, we need to know that over time, and having lived in cities and uh, cultivated uh, environments, uh, many people have genetically uh, become more attached to that than the wilderness. So the wilderness does not work for everyone. We have to realize that. Now, what are the criteria on why the wilderness works? If you have strong genes, uh, if you've been raised uh, in out country, not in downtown city, such as farm life. Also, if you have uh, what you would call um, genes that have not been released yet, but then you would go into the wilderness and you would find them released. That often happens. They're dormant. Yes, I mentioned that one woman that lived in the apartment and took a trip down the Grand Canyon yeah. in one of our last podcasts and changed her her life. She yeah. moved into a house. She started by backpacking and hiking and climbing and running rivers. and It was um, one major experience. For many people, uh, they come out of the wilderness and don't really want to go back there. Sometimes it's the discomfort of the weather. Sometimes it's just that they don't feel safe. Uh, remember, we always have to feel safe and predictable. Well, the wilderness is not a guarantee of safety nor predictability. And that's why we call it wilderness. Yes. Now, as I said in the last podcast, for me, lack of safety and lack of predictability is downtown uh, Los Angeles or Manhattan. <laughs> right. So, right. uh, I'm not comfortable in cities. I don't live in the cities anymore. And we've spent the last uh, 40, 50 years now in mountains. Yes. Small cities. So I, yes. I haven't been in uh, a city since uh, 1971. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. It's the last time I lived in a city. Wow. I lived in Sedona. I lived in Bisbee. I lived in um, Prescott. I live here in Buena Vista now, and uh, I love being surrounded by 14,000 foot peaks. Yeah, it's, it's really something from, special. Yes, very special. So, you either if you have strong genes for wilderness, you're going to love it. That's yes. the first premise. That's the first thing. Um, now, one question is, don't we all come from the wilderness? Why do, why do some of us have... Because genes mutate and change. Got it. So, they've changed over so time. So, again, as I said earlier... Um, I wrote a small paper for my class that um, right in the middle of this uh, teaching of genes that uh, 50 years ago, many people started living by the light switch. Yes, I remember And that. by the thermostat. And, um, and that changes the... Well, then there are cities like Montreal. You can live in an apartment. You can uh, take the underground railroad. Everything you need is there. And uh, never go outside. Yeah, yeah, and so that'll cause internal shifts. 
It'll cause uh, not uh, not uh, necessarily. It can. It can. Okay. Remember, we don't always know what it'll take for a gene shift. They're not predictable. Um, so in my case, um, I grew up in around farms early. Then I was in around cities, but cities didn't take. So even by the time I'm in uh, late teens, early high school, I'm going to places like uh, Yosemite and other natural wilderness places and uh, feel more comfortable. Yeah. Now, I, I shared uh, only uh, one of my children really is very strong. One's semi for the wilderness. One, uh, she never went in the wilderness again and be okay, even though I took her when she was very small. Her daughter has very strong and I have another uh, grandson, and then, um, so I have six grandkids and only two of them are really very strong in the wilderness. Wow. And even though I took them, they had many encounters when they were young, starting at four or five, it didn't take. Wow. They prefer the city. Wow. And, um, yes. So, the other thing is that if you have experiences that are positive in the wilderness for you that will may cause a mutation or a love for and that's what we call epigenetics so if an experience is profound enough uh, even in your lifetime you may find a love for it but to pass on a real genetic change may take till the next generation or two generations so we don't know yes uh Many of us want uh, as much wilderness and uh, national forests and national parks saved. Um, not just for our own selfish needs, but because um, of your point, we started in the wilderness. We started in, you know, what was living in caves and mm -hmm. living in wikiups and being with the animals. Mm -hmm. And the animals were our were our first to pray and food. So now moving on, uh, <clears throat> it does come down to attraction connection. So many people who have a predisposition, when they get in the wilderness, there's an immediate connection. Okay. Now it doesn't mean that that connection will be overnight. Sometimes when I would take people out, it'd be three and four days before they acclimated, oh, I'm not in the city. And uh, what happens when you live in a city and you listen to uh, all kinds of noises from sirens to big trucks, why well, you turn it off, so to speak. In the middle ear, it gets turned off and doesn't necessarily go to the brain. Though if you choose to listen, you can turn it right back on. It's not relevant as much. It's not just not relevant, there's nerve centers that send impulses down to the middle ear and say, I, you know, in loose language would be, uh, you know, I, I hear the noises, but I don't need to hear them anymore. Same when you wear clothing. You can feel it when you put it on, but after a while, you don't recognize. People all the time say, where are my glasses? And they'll be sitting up on top of their head. Right, yeah. That's a perfect example. Yes. Okay. yeah. So... Uh, Often, that, as I said, about the fourth day, oh, wow, I can hear the birds. I can hear the coyotes In the singing. wilderness. In the yeah. wilderness. Yeah. I can hear the rush of the creek. I can hear You're the leaves. Up. You know, you pay attention. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, now the brain is paying attention to those things. And those sensations are bringing, coming in, okay? We're constantly evaluating our environment. All right? So we constantly... Otherwise, we would freeze without knowing, for example, or burn up. So we're constantly evaluating, not just temperature, but sounds and sights and, and um, kinesthesia. So we're reading the environment all the time through our senses. Yeah. Okay. Now, remember, there's no such thing as an influence. There's only attraction connection. Um, the next major principle is that... Um, 
for genetic change to occur, there has to be enough phenomena that affect the genes on the chromosomes and the alleys and then even the other genes that sit right on top uh, to stimulate that. Then we have, I have very strong genes attached to the wilderness. And I think they began when I was a young boy on the farm. And, you know, being close to the wilderness and running in the woods. So those phenomena uh, stuck in epigenetically, they're still with me to this day. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happens is that if we show a gentle, easy being in the wilderness, the animals will contact us. But if we go in and make a lot of noise and if we go in and uh, shoot things like guns, and then they learn to stay away from us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes any animals a day or so. Now, those are the principles. Um, the other principles are that you have to be in touch with potentials in the wilderness. Today we're going to do um, the beginning session on the spontaneous kinds of things that are not full tr life transformation. And I want you to ask all the questions you want in there as I illustrate some of these stories and ask me about them. Um, let's start with uh, one that was very poignant. Um, and I'll also talk about places and geography in the wilderness, how important that is. And I might begin with that story. I'm working with this young man, he's in his early 30s, and we're up in the uh, uh, caldera of the um, peaks at uh, Flagstaff, formerly called San Francisco. Uh, now they're the peaks named for the Kachina. And uh, it wasn't right. We were doing okay, but it just didn't, something was wrong. So we sat in the meadow and went over that day. And then we both realized we're up in the mountains and he needs a restart in a river, like his baptism. We packed up everything. We went all the way down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, moved our whole site. He jumped into the Colorado River, got out, and then we did a lot of then integrating of what that meant about starting over. And um, since we all come out of the water <laughs> before, why uh, we go back in the water for new starts. It was an amazing phenomena. And then the work from there on in, we remained in the Grand Canyon to do uh, at different levels up to the top. The point I'm making is that that uh, event of not being okay in the mountains, even though it was all right, it wasn't quite solid. And uh, that leads me to the other uh, principle. When I'm working with someone, before I take them into the wilderness, um, why I, um, I talk a lot about their issues and what they're feeling and and then together we pick a spot. We might be by a, a creek because it's safe. We might be up in the mountains because he, he needs a challenge. We might be stalking and therefore be uh, deep in the woods and uh, doing different stalking exercises. It depends on kind of what might unleash what's going on within the person. Okay. And in that particular case, made a move. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to make sure I understand completely. So... You're creating experiments with in, in spontaneous exercises right. within the wilderness right. to together together with the client right. to stimulate an experience that supports them psychologically. Yes, and also we're getting things directly now out of the wilderness. <clears throat> so you're you're working both the gestalt of practicing it here and now. Yes. Acting out the transformations, yes. acting out the principles of, yes. of that. 
and then you're also using the symbolism of nature yes. and the, the, the transformational images that that brings to mind. Exactly. And so then, going down, baptizing, canyon, exactly. birthing, that's all symbolic to that so, person. Yeah, but those are the ceremonies then. Ceremonies, got it. So you have the exercises and you have the trance work and you have the work with the mandala while the parts talk. Um, exercises, trance work as well? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and then I might, I may have them journal, and some things in the journaling, new ideas come forth. Um, so what I did, uh, I kept their focus on their experience. So for example, I did all the cooking and all the dishes. I didn't want any kind of break. Uh, we'd eat together, but I, I would take the chore, so he could keep his mind on where he was was and what he was doing. Okay. And uh, sometimes I gave him assignments. Sometimes I ask him to write in his journal. Sometimes I ask him to go do a ceremony while I was doing the dishes, for example. That would be a perfect example. Wow. Now, um, sometimes you're just walking along and um, the things you see and an, another situation, a spontaneous, we're walking along and this <clears throat> man sees this dead tree leaning against this living tree. And he said, that's it. That's my brother and I. He's always leaning on me. You know, he's always asking me to somehow enable him, get him jump started and so forth. And I'm kind of tired of, because of that dead weight is on me. Mm -hmm. Just like I see that dead tree on that living tree. That sparked two and a half hours sitting under the tree, integrating all that and, and designing how he wants to handle it looking at the parts of him. Uh, he wasn't going to abandon his brother, but he went to find new ways of that were not burdening, for example, that didn't, didn't build any resentment, but that he could continue to give to his brother and not feel like he was being taken advantage of or leaned on, so to speak, like the dead tree. It's mm. another example. Another time... Um, I'm working with this guy, and we're we're really we're sitting around uh, the fire. We're up in the San Jacinto, this beautiful set of mountains, uh, just uh, west uh, of of um, Palm Springs, and um, they're they go up to about ten, eleven thousand, and we're sitting there, and we're talking, and all of a sudden he starts digging this little tiny tree that is being trying to make its way out of the rocks. Oh, you know, it's amazing what trees can get started. Well, he's struggling, and he's, and so he starts digging all the rocks away from the tree, and then I start helping him. And all of a sudden, he realizes and says it out loud. When I dig these rocks away, I'm opening my life. I got to get rid of the rocks that are in my life for me to bloom and, and, and thrive and, and flourish. Wow. And so that... That simple act became a metaphor that became a set of actions for his own life. And he followed through on those. Really? Uh, he followed yeah. through and um, carried out uh, many things that you would say would be rock removal. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. So the, the experiment is, it has direct impact on how they yeah. live their and life. And it didn't start as an experiment. Like, I didn't assign it. It just happened naturally. It just happened. He just was digging and... And pretty soon he was conscious of what he was doing. And then it took on a greater form. I mean, initially, I'm sure he just thought, well, I'll pull a few rocks away and help this tree. Then it became paramount. Then the digging really became serious. Then he wanted to clear this, and he did. We dug down about a foot or so until uh, the tree was in nothing and surrounded by nothing but dirt. Huh. So why do the metaphors have so much meaning? Metaphors have always had meaning in our life because we're able to both fantasize and see and use things like allegories and metaphors and substitutes uh, because they uh, provide um, what you might say the, the, the fodder or they, might, they provide the ammunition for our work, or the, the food is another way of looking at it, for the actual thing you're doing. And um, I'll, I'll give you another example from my life, and I'll ask you 
what you did. There's no way 35 years ago I could have got clean and sober cold turkey. It just wouldn't happen. I'm such strong, addictive possible. Pillars. That's true for anything I do. So I hate chocolate. <laughs> well, you're, uh, you're not going to want to drink when you eat chocolate because <laughs> the two don't go together. I ate chocolate and I was sick of chocolate finally. And then I gave up chocolate and now I'm back to it eating moderately. But uh, I use that as a substitute for alcohol. As it was a compensation until such time as I felt like I could stay sober without, uh, you know, going back to alcohol. It was a compensation to help you transform into a different life. Yes, into, yeah. You know, or to get Beautiful. past the urge of alcohol. Well, that's like in... Um, in the twelve-step programs for sobriety, we replace our uh, addiction to alcohol and substance with addiction to spirituality and yes, not every service work and <laughs> uh, prayers and meditations right. and and uh, if you go to those meetings, you know people will compulsively drink coffee and compulsively help other people. Some people, all kinds of things, all sorts of things. But a lot of people don't. Yeah, and so that's the difference. You can put the blo- the plug in the jug. And not have had a drink in 30 years, but you're not really living sobriety. You can put the plug in the jug, start finding substitutes, then start building on positive attributes, like you said, spirituality, giving, helping others, finding new addictions that are positive, and now you're on the way to sobriety. Sobriety is more than just not drinking. Yes. And we describe that yeah, often. It's, it's proactive. Right, right. Yeah. I would liken that to a school teacher. When I was a school psychologist, why some teachers uh, every year was brand new, and some teachers did the same things they did 30 years ago. Right. What do you think would happen if people stopped trying to fix themselves and just accepted who they were and worked with the reality and uh, d- directed their life on the basis that they are okay. who they are? Okay, it won't happen. Carl Rogers... Um, started on that, that just awareness was enough, and it wasn't. So another analogy is uh, you have to stop uh, a behavior that's like a runaway train and then replace it with positive acting. So just being aware is not enough. You have to actually fix it. You have to do take steps. Oh, got it, yeah. yeah. So you have to actually get in and do things. And that's what people do now going back to the wilderness. Um, so wait, but before we do that, so I just I, I think that's important to slow down on that one because you're saying that you have to be aware, right? But then you have to also take action on that awareness. Exactly. It's not enough just to say I accept who I am. Exactly. Um, however, to to what I was saying was the tendency for people to look at themselves pathologically. That's, no, that's different. That's what I was trying to get. Yeah, to. no, that's. So the, tell me more about oh, that my, side of things. The worst thing we do. A perfect example, we don't uh, denigrate people with diabetes. We, we, we don't give them dirty names and nasty names, but we do with alcohol. So one of the things that often happens is if you're called the name, you play the game. Uh, we did uh, uh, experiments in the 60s uh, when I had psych uh, techs that I taught that were working in hospitals. So we went in once and we... Uh, we, the depressives were all together, the psychotic acting out, whether it's a bi, something more like bipolar or manic or maybe it's more like uh, schizophrenia. And what happens is when they're all together, those who are in the depressive unit, they see who can be the best depressive. <laughs> right. Okay? Right. When you put them in different groups, and there's maybe only one or two depressives, three or four of this, and a couple of catatonics, and a, yeah. you know, okay. Guess what happens? The, the depressive's sitting in the corner, and oh, woe is me. And the others come and say, get off your butt, we're going to lunch. How does it work? Do they it work? works. They, they stop trying to be the best depressive. <laughs> right, right. Okay? Yeah, yeah. People often compare, same as with, uh, it's what we call hypochondria. I mean, the thousands of organs that have been take, taken out because somebody just keeps pestering a doctor till they take it out. Right. Another example. Now, um, another perfect example. 
One of my students who got a PhD at uh, Arizona State University um, decided she wanted to work with uh, children who were molested or abused. So she went to the city and said, instead of everybody taking a different tape and you keep re-traumatize them, let me do one tape very gently so they don't get traumatized. Then I'll share the tape with all of you. If you then you can go to court with it or the, yeah. you know, whatever the case. So what happens many times with trauma is we keep talking about it. And the more we talk about it, the more the brain... You keep reliving it. You keep reliving it and you keep the, keep the symptoms of it. Okay? So you keep talking about how wounded you are. And then meanwhile, you're not focusing on all the great opportunities for growth. Another simple example is uh, in the 60s, we had these great big cubes and we had bats. And so they, oh, that's a way to get rid of anger. Hit on it. No. People just started going to groups so they could hit the big cube. Right. You got to deal with what is. And doing more of what is is not the way of dealing with it. That's why replacement. Okay. And also, you don't want to go where there's potential. I don't tend bar. I'm not going to tend bar <laughs> the rest of my life. I'm not going to hang out with the things I loved, <laughs> gin, I'm pouring in somebody else's glass. Right. Why? Because of attraction, connection. Not because of influence. But I can go back and seeing that, I can live, I can taste it. Wow. I don't know if you've ever had experience like that. I've opened up my daughter's freezer one time, and there was a bottle of gin. And I grabbed it, and in 30 seconds, in my mind, I consumed it. I was heading to the store. My mouth was watering, but I laughed because I have enough years of sobriety to know that he comes. Right. So, okay. What's now, the difference between attraction and connection and influence? The difference is attraction and connection follows all the biological phenomena. Um, birds will do uh, dances to attract a mate. Uh, a butterfly uh, will send out pherons, and a male butterfly up to a mile away will get a whiff and head right that way. Okay. And then what do people mean when they say influence that you disagree they with? They mean that you have power over someone. You can only have power over someone if they take it in. But that's not so much influence. You may have, they may be under your c control, uh, and so that doesn't mean you like it. People do what their bosses tell them and grumble about it. They do it because they want the job. Got They're it. not influenced. What about suggestible? Are people suggestible? No. That's yeah. not a thing no, either. No, that's, that's influence. Same, same principle. Same thing. Okay. Um, now, what we are, if, again, you look at the attraction. If somebody calls you pathological, whatever the term is used, then you act that out. So give them the name, they play the game. Yes. So if someone says you have a disorder, then you right. might carry that around. Right. and act that myth exactly. out in your life. Whereas if you look at it from, from the standpoint of this is just a creative aspect of my existence and it's my, it's my responsibility what I choose to do with it, then you have a totally different phenomenon. Again, I go back to what we said in the early tapes. It is what it is. It's what you do with it that matters. That comes right out of the Tao Te Ching. Okay. People have a hard time with that. People have a terrible time because we're at the height right now of blame society. Say more. Uh, we want to blame everybody else for why we're not okay. Right now, it happens to be going on <laughs> at the highest office in our country. Yeah. Now, let's go back to the wilderness. <clears throat> Sometimes, events in the wilderness. So I took a man into the uh, Dragoon uh, Mountains, which are right... Uh, by Benson, uh, Arizona. Beautiful uh, granite mountains. And uh, the forecast had been for fair weather. Well, Arizona doesn't always follow forecasts. And uh, it's one of those states that uh, can change very quickly. And the reason is because you have many uh, contributing factors, such as uh, the Sea of Cortez, the Pacific Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, uh, jet streams, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that make a difference. Now, it snowed, and it snowed about 18 inches. And 
he went into the tent, got into the sleeping bag. I gave him extra uh, blanket that I had carried in and did not come out for over 24 hours. So I'm thinking, what have I got? Well, I got a nine-year-old pissed-off guy, and something must have happened around nine because it sent him back. He's regressed. So what do you do? Well, you build a big fire instead of a little <laughs> indigenous fire. You build a big fire, white man fire. And you make hot chocolate. That's good for a nine-year-old. So I make hot chocolate, got a big fire going, invite him out. He comes out. He then just opens up. When he was nine years old, his father came home from <coughs> um, Korea and beat on him all the time. So he was always looking for an escape, and he always needed to know where the directions off. So what set him off is when in the snowstorm he didn't know north from south, okay, in a whiteout, he had no idea what the directions were, and he didn't know how to read other signs. And that's what panicked him. That's what sent him back. That's what sent him into hiding. So we worked through it, but that didn't mean it was gone. So now, the next thing that he brought that in was shame. You can only be shamed if you can attract shame, okay? I can't be shamed or guilted. This is, if somebody doesn't like me, there's going to be something wrong with them because I'm fine. And it's like, it's a nice attitude. It pisses people off because they like to shame you. I can't. I'll make my amends if I see that I contributed to something that wasn't appropriate, but I don't get, I don't carry guilt or shame. You don't have the genetics for that. I don't have the genetics for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now shame is hit. Now he's blurted it all out. So now he wants to go out. So uh, we pack up and we go down a, a level. But I encourage him to stay a little bit because I want to show him a few things. Uh, I wanted to show him the... Um, we're, we're coming out of the mountains and there's a great big high desert valley. And the coyotes go out there and hunt at night, but they live in the granite mountains right behind us. We're at the edge of them now. Mm. We're at the edge of the granite. And, the, and I said, if they've eaten, they'll come straight in. You can watch them just zip by. If they haven't eaten, they go skirting around bushes looking for a rodent or a rabbit or something. And um, so we were going to do that the next morning and we and we did and, uh, and then he went back to bed we did it around four just around early light <clears throat> I go up and do one of the things I often do and that's sing with the canyon wrens because in Granite Mountains you have all these canyon wrens and they go <laughs> but the end of it is unique to them alone so they all start off the same but then they ended according to their own style. Each bird. Wow. Each bird. Pretty cool. Yeah, so I'm sitting up there. But I'm sitting around with all the girls, okay? And they are sitting around me. And all of a sudden, the male comes flying and looks me right in the eye and says, Huh, can't make love to you. What are you worth? And away he goes. And the girls and I start singing again. I mean, they get it, okay? And, and it's almost like they're all laughing. Right. And they're from here to here. They're all around. Same when I go up and sing with the coyotes at a full moon or a you know, nice night of bright stars mm. and there's no overcast and they love to sing at night. They also sing to each other about where the prey is and where they are and okay, we got a sight on this, come over and others will join. Um, sometimes they hunt singly, sometimes they hunt in groups. The point I'm making is that I just immerse myself in the wilderness. And so that's what I do. And they respond. I often at night time sing with the owls. Mm. Or be up by a little water supply where they're going to come in and find a rodent. And yeah. I'm there and I sing you to them. You connect. I connect. Deeply. With, there it is. Yeah. There's Attraction and connection. Yeah. And if I sing their song and I get it close enough, they sing back. Ravens. Another thing. Uh, now, I look down. He's packing up to leave. Oh, my God. I rush down. I'm about a 1,000 feet higher than him in the, in the rocks. And um, 
He's just bound to tell me he's going to go. And I said, you know, it's going to get hot out there. It's the middle of April. And the desert, middle of April, with a storm gone. That sun's going to be hot. And we don't have a lot of protection. And uh, I said, okay, you insist on going out. I'll go out with you. So I gathered up as much water as I could. To get more, I had to go back up into the mountains where the, you know, the little creeks are and where the little springs are. But I had, felt I had enough. So I said, this is what we're going to do. If I see that you get too tired or I see that you're not drinking enough, <laughs> I'm going to give you the water and then I'll run the west of the road. So it's about a 15-mile hike out. Wow. And uh, we stopped one time and, and I evaluated him. I said, well, and he said, you would really leave the water with me? I said, of course. Why would you run on? I said, because I run marathons. And the thing about running a marathon is, uh, yeah, you need the water, but you also know you can go a number of miles. I mean, it's just built in your, that's another epigenetic. You know you can go a long time. Even if you have to slow down or rest, you, you know you can keep going. Uh, that's what happens by the training necessary to run a marathon. So he just starts crying. And all of a sudden, I become the father that he never had. The father would run to the road to get him more water and come back more. Wow. So we start with a snowstorm, pissed off little boy. Bring him out for hot chocolate. Shares everything. Then he gets shame. Then you gently deal with the shame and try to give him a couple more experiences. But you honor it. You don't beat up on him. You have to stay. You signed up for so many. No. If he really needs to go out, then you, you take him out. And uh, But in the taking of him out, you don't shame him more. Mm -hmm. So in the idea of I'll run to the road, it just bursts open. Now, what is the outcome? The outcome is that he then became a great candidate in marital therapy because what he would do, if he got pissed off, he'd disappear. If he wasn't sound about where he was supposed to be, he'd disappear. Now he didn't disappear. He stayed and worked through the issue with his spouse. Wow. Yeah. That was the transformation. That was the, the transformation. And he was able to, I mean, he would go through relationships like you change your socks. I mean, it was amazing. So, um, you know, those kinds of things that happen very spontaneously because of something that gets stripped or something that an event changes and um, sometimes it happens because you assign that person to do something and or something literally happens in the trip. So I've got a young man um, I'm in my 50s, he's in his 30s. He's really been doing a lot of mountaineering. So we are leave Durango. Well, we go up on uh, Endlich Mesa. We All of us climbers used to call it Endless Mesa because you can walk all the way. It's long, long. And that time of year, the only people up there are sheep herders and all their sheep. So you're about 9,000 feet. But it's a great big plateau. And it leads into the Chicago Basin and to the spears and the spires that are there. Uh, I said spears, I mean spires. My good old dyslexia. And uh, so, uh, 14ers. And we came to the end and we're now entering, uh, we're about uh, three to four miles from Chicago Basin where then we'll, all the big 14ers will be right around us and we'll be at about anywhere between 11 and 12. And I'm watching the weather, and I realized we're going to be exposed if we go and stay on this ridge. And it may get dark and nasty in the weather with wind and the heavy snow. So I say, well, we're going to stay here. No, let's go on. And he's very strong. 
It's not anything to do with him being tired. I know we're going to stay here. Well, and he's bitching and moaning, and I just said, well, I, I, he says, why are we staying here? I said, you see this little kind of little, little cliff? It's just about nine, nine feet tall. We're going to camp right underneath it. The wind's going to blow over our head. Most of the snow's going to blow past us. We won't even get a lot of snow. We'll snuggle down in, okay? We'll put the fire out in front of us. The fire will warm the, the cliff, okay, until it goes out. And we'll be pretty toasty. We'll be, we'll be all right. We won't get the blast of that strong wind because it's the wind blowing the cold that really is where it gets bad and hypothermia can set in. About the time we finish that conversation, here comes the guy and he's going on. Now my client is really pissed. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to be a wuss. Let's go. I said, no, we're staying here. Early in the next morning, as soon as it's light, here comes the guy. He said, oh, my God, you guys are the right thing. My tent blew all apart. I almost froze to death. I had to stay up and do exercises all night long. Uh, I couldn't start the f stove. It wouldn't stay lit. Uh, just got battered. I finally found a little bit of cover, but it was the most miserable light I've, I've ever had. And I'm so glad uh, I didn't get hypothermia because I came real close. Wow. And he walks past us and tells us that story. Now my client looks at me and says, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's how it all changes. That's how the, I mean, emotions and feelings are wild in the wilderness. And just as much as he bitched the night before, and well, it didn't turn out to be a bad day. Now we got all this snow, and we're right in front. We're at about 12. We're right in front of this great big 13,000 feet peak that has wonderful glissading. You know how to glissade? Mm -hmm. You just slide down mm. and you use your ice axe to oh, wow. slow you down and guide you around That's cool. rocks. But this one was an open field. We're, gonna, we're not going to hit any rocks. And it was enough new snow on top of it. It's going to be wonderful and not enough to avalanche. So... Um, we spent the day glissading. We'd climb back up and slide down. It was delightful. And then uh, what came out of that work? And what came out of that work is that there were many times when he rushed in to angels fear to tread, so, so to speak. And he rushed in and got himself in difficulty. And he said, that experience tells me I don't want to be gung-ho. I don't want to push. Sometimes you hunker down. Sometimes, you know, you saved our life, probably. And I said, well, uh, if you're prone to hypothermia, I guess we did. But I said, yeah. And uh, we have to sometimes always be careful of the things that we do. Um, so there's sometimes we want to turn around or stop or find safety or, or climb up because there's going to be a flood through this arroyo on and on. Mm. And that's the wilderness guide's job. Um, questions? Well, I've just taken in the stories. Uh, one of the things that sticks out to me is the, the wisdom, the discerning wisdom to know when enough is enough and how to temper the, the compulsion to keep moving and things like that. And that probably comes from experience and, and parts of you that know how to regulate that situation if I'm that's right. right. Yeah. And anybody who's going to be a wilderness guide needs to take EMT or mountain medicine and also study up a lot. Look for things like uh, altitude sickness if you're climbing. Look for things by like how cold do they get. Body homeostasis is not the same for everybody. Some people do real well in the cold. Some people, man, lower than 40, they're in trouble. Yeah. So it depends on on the person and what they what's happening. Yeah. And uh, and then know your terrain. Uh, there was some guys from California who were up on the Navajo Reservation where there's a great big uh, canyon and uh, clear sky, but he didn't really check the weather. Rained upstream, and he lost three people in the flood. Wow. And Mistakes that's something are costly out there. What's that? Mistakes are costly out Mistakes there. Mistakes are costly. 
And that's a, one of the big difference between how humans live now compared to how they lived thousands of years ago is yeah. um, we have more of a buffer between us and yeah, nature. Yeah, but we don't. You're more likely to get by a car than you are get. Oh, is that right? Flood. Oh, yeah. Wow. You're more likely. The cities are where it's dangerous. It does. Does it? Does it not seem though that we're we're more comfortable? We, we're we're evolving to be in our comfort zones and not push ourselves or. To... No, I gotta I gotta clear that up. Yeah, tell me. Nature, wilderness, earth, is no respecter of persons. They the earth doesn't really give a shit if it catches you in a storm. <laughs> Well, that's what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is that you're less likely to, with a little bit of caution in the wilderness, than you are to get hurt in society. Than you are to hurt in society. Yeah. We're more likely to get hurt in a city. We have more dangers in a city. In the wilderness? I've not heard for many in the recent gun killings, anybody going up in the wilderness. It, it seems, happens, but It not. seems to me that the wilderness, though... Uh, crafts and, and molds us in a way that's much different than the way that, that civilization does. It, in contacting the wilderness, we awaken in our senses. There's an aliveness and a vitality that's activated and a, a strength and resiliency that is not... It's exactly right. That doesn't happen in the city. Well, it happens in the city. You get city-wise. Got I'm going to give a perfect example. In 1985... Uh, I was a consultant to Park Place, which was for uh, alcohol treatment for adolescents. Uh, they were also getting ready to go to multi-diagnosis. And um, we happened to ha take out a group of kids at the end of treatment. Um, and when I did that, why my wife and um, my daughter and her husband and myself, so the four of us would be out there. Uh, to you know, there'd be about ten kids or eight kids, and uh, oh, they were petrified about a potential bear, or cougar, or mm. snake. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, they knew the city; they knew how to walk down dangerous streets and get out of the way. And got it. And as it depends on the environment you adapt it to. Okay, so it's not necessary that that you're not going to build strengths in the city, obviously, because if there's struggles to yeah, you're going to build strengths right. in the city. That's what I'm saying. That's survival strengths in. Right. Different. It's different. It's but different. It's still. But you build survival um, strengths in the. And then there's some things about energies, okay? Uh, I told the story of the skunk in our, our one of our two previous. Yeah. That, and he's in my mandala now. Okay. You, how do you answer the question that I've never been sprayed? One, I don't rush at him, and I don't, and I'm very easy going. And I talk to him, but the other is, they don't recognize me as a threat. And the story that I told was one more of companionship. He could have shit on my sleeping bag. He actually took his shit next to it, and then he hung around when I come up with my nose and and talked to him. He's sitting right there. He didn't run away. He sat right there, and I swear to God. I felt the energy coming from him. I'm one of your brothers. Why didn't you leave something for me? You cleaned up so damn well, there's not a scrap here. And, uh, and then he went off in a huff. But he didn't spray me. I'm from the same distance. You're the skunk and I'm here, right? And I'm my sleeping bag. Yeah. So I've had hundreds of rattlesnake encounters, never been struck. Yeah. And not even a, uh, an attempt to. Now, sometimes... Uh, as a matter of fact, they only had a couple coils. Most of the time, they go away. By here, they're rattling. Off they go into rocks or the creek. Yeah. And this challenges the whole idea that consciousness is reserved for human beings. Yes, it's not. It does. It, it's not. Right. right. So, and that brings us back into the, uh, the idea of panpsychism. I want to tell a really funny story. The reason it's funny is because I don't do real well with... Uh, snowmobiles or ha, the four wheels. I, I mean, I love the wilderness not to have those motors. But they have a right to them, and I know their places. One year, a friend of mine who lives uh, on the Muggy Own Rim, south of Flagstaff, said, my wife and I are coming up from Phoenix. We have a cabin. Come on and join us for the weekend, and maybe we'll snowshoe, or maybe we'll go to Flag and ski, 
or maybe we'll just sit by the fire. Well, it snowed like hell, and we took a couple of walks. But I had my cross-country skis, and toward the Sunday, said, "Well, I got to get out of here, and I don't want to be driving in the dark and snow. So, till I can get off the rim, why it's going to be snowy and wet." And he looks at me and he says, "You don't want to go, do you?" I said, "No." He said, "Plenty of food in the fridge." Lock it up. Put the key here when you're done. <clears throat> We're coming next week, so you don't have to turn off the. I'll leave the little leave the heater on at this, so the pipes don't freeze, and and we're gonna come back anyway, because um, it was springtime. This was the spring. So I got up the next morning and I said, "Okay, I'm gonna brave it," but the snow was too deep for the <laughs> snowmobiles. They they would sink too deep. Oh, wow. I mean, I was plowing and dropping 14 inches each step. With your snowshoes? With my snow. No, my cross country skis. Cross country skis, got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah. It was wonderful. So, Mormon Lake is 12 miles over this set of uh, forest roads that are now just covered in snow that normally would just be hammered with snowmobiles. And you got it all to yourself? I got it all myself. And I'm about halfway across and Here's the Mormon Lake, and here's Mormon Mountain, 10,000 feet. And here's this beautiful male coyote, huge. He had to be seven years old, and he was just regal. He stops in the tracks, and he looks at me and says, What the hell are you doing out here? I mean, my God, you know, we have to put up with these snowmobiles, and finally we get a day without them, and you show up. And I said, I know, but I'm not making any noise, and I'm not hassling you. And I'm not chasing you down with it. I said, well, no, you're not. Well, okay. This went on for a half hour. He stood there, I stood here. You just stood there together. And talked to him, and he wasn't more and than... he didn't move. He didn't move, no. He wasn't more than 30 feet away. That's really odd. And, you know, they cock their heads, wow. and they look at you, and, you know, they, they have to communicate in their language. Wow. And you hope you're picking it up, and... What come. do you mean their language? How do you know? They have, they have all kinds of languages. All of their barks, all of their little whines all have meaning. All of their body movements all have meaning. When you say, the coyote said to me this, is that the energy that you're feeling? From I'm feeling it? the energy. And you're interpreting I'm it. interpreting. I could be wrong, but most times I'm not. How, how, how would you Well, then I'll tell you. <laughs> one, uh, let me finish the story, and yeah, then I'll yeah, tell you yeah. another story. Okay. Okay. Um... Well, you know, I'm, my feet are getting cold, but I'm, I'm moving them enough to, because it's, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's still cloudy, but it's a beautiful day, and, you know, clouds are warmer than clear, as you know, uh -huh. and when you're out, so there's still moisture, it's warmer. And I say, you know, my feet are getting cold, I got to move, I say, well, he, says, he waits back, nods his head, he goes on into the trees, he's heading up toward Mormon Mountain, and I'm heading toward Mormon Lake. I don't get 20 feet, and here comes a red-tailed hawk. He circles around me. What the hell are you doing in here? You don't have a snowmobile. And he circles, and I whistle to him. Shh, 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 shh. And he whistles back. And we talk to no, each other. Yeah. And, yeah, and the whistles, and he goes around me. And, and, uh, and he lasts uh, probably 10 minutes. Then he flies off, and then I go on. So I did 24 miles that day, 12 miles over, 12 miles back, in silence except those two encounters. I saw a scurry of a few little rabbits that tried to come out and find something to eat, but uh, then run back to the wells or their trees or whatever. But that was pretty much it. And saw a raven or two later in the day. But. So I have a nephew. He came to, because he really wanted to go in the Grand Canyon, he came the first time with his father, and he fell in love with the wilderness. And he loves it to this day. He's grown now, just finishing college. And um, we took a walk. We did a number of things. We slept right on the edge of the canyon. And I said, look at that. I'm going to rope you in. Or, it's because... 
I don't want you to go over the edge. She said, yeah, I said, you're sleeping awful close if you roll over the edge. We were out on the point that gives the greatest view of the Grand Canyon, of the turns and everything. Mm. And it's this wonderful point way out there. Um, it's actually west of uh, the North and South Rim uh, centers. And the next day I said, let's go up this creek. So we go up this creek, and it's toward the end of the day. And um, Perea, as a matter of fact, so it comes right out where the, the boaters are at uh, Lee's Ferry, mm. put in. And there's an orchard there that was came when Lee and his family lived there. And uh, the critters come in. Some come to on the fruit. Uh, some come in to get those rodents that are on the fruit. <clears throat> such as coyotes. We're walking back down, and I look up and I, I see this female up there. And she starts talking to me, and I start talking to her. And as we get down, her language is more irritable. And he picks it up too, my nephew. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have nearly the time in the wilderness, but he picks it up. And he says, what, what's going on? I said, she's telling us we're real close to the orchard and that's her territory and don't be messing with it. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you humans always come in where we are. Blah, blah, blah. She's kind of bitching. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife picks it up my dough and says, she is bitching. I said, yeah. So, so when I got down, I gave her this great big long call and said, we're gone, sweetie. And I uh, gave her kind of a goodbye call as they often do when they sign sign off. And she signed off with a much sweeter tone and and uh, oh, wow. the orchard orchard was hers. Wow. If we walk through it all the roads will disappear. If she comes yeah. through that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, I got a hundred of those. Maybe we'll do some of nothing but animal stories. Yeah. But um, consciousness runs through everything. Yes. And um, communicates and... We don't know how much. Well, you know, how much consciousness does a frog have? Well, it's hard for us to judge. And some scientists still but don't they, believe they have no, any. But, uh, and some think it's only genetic habit. Right. But, uh, you know, I've seen too many situations where there's... Oh, I'll give you a simple one, real simple. I had a cat in the mountains, lived 21 years, held all records. Nobody around me had an outside cat that lived more than two or three years. My cat uh, practiced coyote survival. We'd take a little tiny walk. He never went more and walk more than an eighth to a quarter of a mile. At that time, he started whining, whining, whining. Yeah, I'm whining. Let's go back home. I'm, I'm out. It's not safe out there. But if you pick him up, no, I don't want you to hold me. Go back home. I didn't know where more it was. He had his mind. We just were taking him back home and then go back out again. Because mm -hmm. who's going to walk for a walk only go an eighth of a mile? Mm -hmm. But what he would do is he would be walking along. He'd run up a pine tree up about 10, 15 feet and come back down. Oh, then wow. run up a pine tree and wow. come back down. Wow. Is that amazing? It is amazing. How is that illustrating the consciousness? It's the illustrating the consciousness is that he's planning on escapes. He's doing, he's consciously running up that. He's choosing to run up that. Creative choices. Well, for him, it's, uh, I'm practicing survival. Just the same as the conscious choice where we get an eighth of a mile away, I don't feel safe. So consciousness implies choice. Yes. And that's why free will is one of the basis of your model. Yes. Yeah. Whoever um, created us, some energy field, whatever, doesn't matter. Whoever created us, gave us a body, gave us uniqueness, so no two things are alike that have a body, and gave us free will. Yes, yes. Now, I've read all kinds of articles that say we don't have free will, but we do. I've, I, I have too. There's, scientists are debating it. There's some scientists think we have free will. Some philosophers think we do. Some don't. Right. Yeah. Some but, I, but I use Sophie's Choice as a movie to teach free will. Yeah. I and I asked people how they would respond. Yeah, we talked. I think we talked about. We that talked about it. And I showed you. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know. 
Yes, and uh, actually, we had with one commenter version. said that your choice would have got you all killed. Did you believe that? Yeah. The because you said I would I would take the gun I'd punch right. him or, and the guy said the good doctor's opinion would get them all killed. Right, but I was. But you don't. Get, you'd rather die. I'd rather be. I would rather die with your choice. By choice, than have one. They take this child. Yeah, there's a. I think the New Hampshire state slogan is "I'd rather live on my feet than die on my knees." Yes, <laughs> that's a good one. It's huh? a good one. Um, He's right, though. I have much chance that of getting killed, but not always. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the arguments that I've heard for determinism is that it's just complicated, reductive biological mechanisms and hormones reacting to the environment, and then it's just that's it, and there is no. Uh, there's no choice at play. We're just we're constantly pushed into responses by our genes and our environment, and there's no. Then it would be no such thing as attraction connection. Exactly. Yeah, and also it would um, it would enable the uh, the victim card, where you know yeah. I don't have a choice. I I I just have to be the way I am. There's well, no I have a choice, and that's to play the victim. Right. But they won't admit it. They give up the power. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to me that free will is essential in transformation. Free will is essential. So it, 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 just acknowledging that even when I'm my, when my... I would rather act as if I have it than right. act as if I didn't. Right, exactly. Yes, and when my... We talk about my black hole sometimes. The part of me that struggles with or, or gets... De proactively gets depressed is the good right. way to talk about it. When he comes through me... I, um, I've been working on realizing that I have a choice of either stopping it, exactly. or doing something else. Exactly. What's funny is that that part of me likes me to think I don't have a choice. Yes. Because then That's it feels more powerful. Yeah. And he writes bigger and better stories. Remember, yeah. mostly with depression, it's not the event of the depression. It's the stories you write about it and the way you feel that enhances the brain right. to think... You know, what a sad life, okay? Right. Um, we never see depressive people that have endogenous depression at F5 in the cingulate gyrus is the most common place. Cingulate gyrus? The cingulate gyrus at F5. Where is F5? That's right down in the center, about in here, about down Remember, there. Yeah. And, uh, That's where depression drives? In the cingulate gyrus, for most. Now, there's other areas that we see them it arises to. Um, People that feel it in the morning, oh, heavy, or oh, I don't want to get out of bed, or oh, I feel sad. Or, they get up and do something. And it changes. They change. One of the things, if you go out and run, and you put all the blood out into the body, you take all that blood, instead of going through the central organs, yeah. and, and get more depressed, you break the depression. Yeah. Now you may get it five minutes after your right. good signal, but a lot of times it doesn't. Right. Um, you remember In essence, you can't stop the biological genetic predisposition of depression happening, the beginning of the event. It's what you do with it when it begins. That's essential. That's essential. You can't essential. stop the, the beginning, but Again. you can change what you do with it. That's exactly. huge. Do you remember Tom Brown Jr.? Great, yeah, sure. Great survival teacher. Just a great teacher like you. Well, he has a great we were parallels. Yeah. He had a grandfather Apache. Yeah, I was in the Apache Mountains in the Jericala. Yeah, same period. Well, he has a great a great lesson he teaches um, on on feelings, and he says one of the questions he asks is, "Well, why are you choosing to feel that way?" Right. It stirs people up to hear that exactly because people don't think they choose I their know. feelings. The other yeah. thing he he'll do is um, he'll talk about how something similar to what you talk about is that no energy is good or bad. It's right. What you do with it that makes it what it exactly. is. Exactly. But See, energy is just energy. See, and, and Tom Brown really did a magnificent job of helping people see how they could thrive in the wilderness yeah. and not only survive. He also helped people to become comfortable in the wilderness. He didn't, yes. think, it, you know, he didn't think he had to stand out in the middle of a rainstorm. No, he showed you how to build a shelter and yeah. how to get out of it and yeah. what to do and on and on and on. Uh, and he, also, he was very, you know, in, in the, I think he started writing in the late 60s, early 70s, and 
profound in his work. And look what he had. He had uh, the Pine Barrens. Uh, in New Jersey. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, a lot of people that I have trained have gone and take courses from him. Yeah, I have. I know you yeah. have. So Several. Yeah. And so the teachings Michael. are right in, uh, the teachings of soul are right in line. Oh, right in line. And it yeah. comes back to pan Because it, it can, that's what comes out of the wilderness. It's consciousness and soul. The yeah. consciousness and the soul of the wilderness. After all, we the came The soul of the all earth. All yeah. yeah. After all, we evolved we out of the muck. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. It is. Yeah. yeah. Now our fear is we're going back into it. Our fear is we're going to drown. Our cities are going to be underwater with global because warming. Of, yeah. Well, who knows what's going to happen. Any next. other questions about how it works in the wilderness? Maybe that I could add another story to. You know, it's just, it's all very shamanic. Yes. And uh, I don't know if that's a good word. but It's a good word in the sense, though, it's a little I don't like the way shamanic becomes a, a mystery woo, woo, and magic. Uh, yeah. yeah, it gets woo, I, woo. I like shamanic based upon natural phenomena. You know, uh, one of Tom Brown's students, John Young, talks about right. there's no such thing as spirituality it just is everything's just a part of nature if it's spiritual it's just a natural phenomenon yeah but there is spirituality right but he says what's the point of making the distinction because the point is very simple because spirituality moves without a body it's an energy within the great universe that moves right. and may not have a semblance of right. a body yes. spirituality may move Way beyond the speed of light, for example. Yes. But here's um, what I learned it. from his point. Just to see, check this out and see how you feel about this. N nature has the ability to create the spiritual no, phenomenon. Sp nature leads to spirituality. Right. Right. It's being in nature that you can learn humility. You can learn gratitude. You can learn the significance. Uh, I'll tell you this. Um, a perfect example, I'm getting ready to introduce this anyway. In 1998, at the Christmas time, Meadow Reed, who became my wife later, we were together uh, until uh, 2015. I'll tell you a little more about that. Um, we went on a 2,500-mile trip all around Arizona. She got, we were down on the Arizona Trail, right at the edge of the Santa Rita Mountains, and it was sunset. I know there's great sunsets all over the world, and there are. But Arizona... Oh, my God. I used to live there. It's amazing. Arizona has some of the finest sunsets in the world. It's amazing. It's amazing. Two and a half hours. This one. Wow. And it just transformed her, and she said, this is where I belong. So, there is a natural phenomena turned into spirituality. She came home. That's what she said. I've come home. That's amazing. Is that amazing? Yeah. So here's how the model works. The self is made up of our genetics, life experiences that they adapt and go with them, then brain physiology that carries out consciousness, which is then coming from the soul, the more we can become soul-directed, the more we are in control of what we want as a soul. Okay? And that takes meditation, concentration, examination, checking things out, trial and error, on and on and on. And the, the more you live by your soul... Now, a lot of times people say, well, what about the minor things? No. Whether you're going to have a hot fudge Sunday or, or a banana split, the soul doesn't have to get involved. The ten-year-old can handle it. You have to have a deep meditation on you your. You don't have to have Sunday. a deep meditation. You're right. You can just do that. But whether you may be moving to Alaska, or, or, or you know, whether you're going to marry this man or woman, on and on and on. What kind of attitude do you want to have? In your More life? than an attitude. Right. What kind of choices? Attitude that leads to a coping style. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. It's how, you know, I I say it this way. At the end of the day, you look in that mirror. That's the only guy you can get past. It. If you look in that mirror and you've lived a life of directed soul and you've taken responsibility when your actions went astray for someone else and you had to see what, what part you played and what part they played and solve the issue. Yeah. And you can look at the end of the... You know, that's why the, the great teachers say to a couple, don't let the sun go down 
on your struggle. Settle it before you go to sleep. So you can go with to your sleep. partner. Yeah. With your partner saying, so go to sleep, snuggling. It's the work that makes the difference. Again, Norman Vincent Peale in the 50s was right on. The power of positive thinking. What he forgot to do was stop the runaway train. All those now in mindfulness say, no, you got to stop the given behavior that's causing you difficulties. Okay. Yeah. Once you stop it, then you replace it with what you want. Something proactive. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in to this conversation about the wilderness, part eight with Dr. Strachan. If you enjoyed this, hit the like button and the subscribe button. Also, leave a comment and let us know if you have any questions for Dr. Strachan. We are going to try to answer as many of your questions as we can. What you can expect coming relatively soon is another conversation with Dr. Strachan expounding upon his philosophies, and then we'll do a Q&A that has been predetermined by questions that were sent in earlier. That should be released within the next month or so. Thank you very much for tuning in, and we can't wait to provide you with more content.